Good evening, guys. So, my name is Gopi Krishnan. So, I'm one of the software engineers in the MMPT. So, my topic for today's session is again trends and tools. So, what I'm planning for this session is uh, I'm going to give like a small idea on how what's the status of gaming uh, in India, like how much it has grown, and what are the main companies in India that's actually working really hard and investing much in India. And also some of the uh, tools that we actually use in the gaming industry, what are the popular ones and uh, on both for the 3D as well as for the 2D engines. Um, and the hierarchical architecture of um, inside the gaming company, like uh, how stuff works. Like, in the software industry, we have the project managers, the team leads, the developers and everybody. Uh, also in the um, gaming industry, we do have a like, pretty different names, but still it goes the same way. Right? So, so mainly uh, India is actually a 900 million dollar <coughs> grown gaming industry companies. So it's almost 900 million dollars. From that 900 million dollars, almost 250 goes for the casual games. So we actually know the growth of the mobiles in India. Like we do have. Uh, with mobiles in which we can actually play almost the AAA titles too. So almost the 250 million goes for the casual, just for the casual games. And for the companies like we have uh, Microsoft, Ubisoft, Singa, Sony and EA in India. But still, uh, if you look up into the software industries, we have uh, Infosys or we have TCS, those are actually uh, Indian homegrown companies. But um, as far as concern for the gaming companies, we don't have like a homegrown company. We have a 900 million dollar growth, but still we are missing a homegrown gaming company. So one of the main reasons behind that is the less knowledge of uh, about the gaming stuffs for the people, among the people. So one of the main reason why I put this session is actually to uh, convey the uh, idea of how stuffs work in the gaming industry, what are the tools that you could actually use. Like you have like an interest in developing games um, and everything else. So uh, just going into the uh, slides, like you no, know, this is the hierarchical order. So first thing is actually the publishers. So publishers is uh, the guys who actually put in the money for the games. Like if you take the uh, the game crisis, uh, the the developers for that game is actually quite like a company in Germany and the publishers is actually the EA. So the EA guys actually put in the money to make that game to the Crytek and they, need the, they develop the game. So the publishers are the guys who actually put in the money, they uh, invest the money, they talk to the, uh, the producers, those are actually like just like the project managers up here. So they, uh, the producers actually put in the schedule and everything out, see how many days it will take for the games to finish and what are the structures, how we have to deal with stuff and everything out. So, goes to directors are just like the team leads, maybe. Like uh, all these divisions, like the artists, the programmers, designers, level designers, all of this has different directors. So, these producers actually communicate with all these directors to see how stuff goes on. No. So, uh, when you actually look for the game, the first thing goes for the artist. So, they make the, the 2D textures, like mostly you know, so the artistic side of what you see in the games. All the textures. Um, all the stuff that you that's actually giving a visual feel is actually done by the artist. Then goes for the programmers. Those are the guys who actually uh, give life to the game. Like if, if you have like a robot or if you have some just like me, okay, I'm actually the model. But still, if I have to move, I have to talk. It's something that we actually do. The programmers do. They they do this stuff to actually make life to me. The designers are actually. Uh, they design, they design the mechanism of the game. Like if I have to press this button to actually change the slides, that's actually designed. That's a mechanism that's been designed by the designers. So these programmers, the designers can actually work closely to see how the mechanisms can be implemented. So level designers are, they design the level. Then let's take this room. The podium is actually up here. We have the, my laptop, everybody sitting here. So this is our option design. So level designers design the complete level of the game to see which steps should go, which side, what should be up here, everything out. So that's how that's how the designers do the mechanism to see how things are done and the programmers they work all together to implement everything out. 
the sound engineers do. They they build the sounds, they make the sounds, uh, they engineer the sounds and everything else. Game testers are also the same thing. Test the game. So mostly for game testing wise, they don't have like a like a fixer tool. Mostly it's game testing is actually playing the game and to see uh, if that mechanism or the uh, game play works the same way as it's been uh, done as, as by the clients. Uh, for coding wise, we profile the codes to see uh, if that is actually much efficient to uh, uh, bring on a much efficient way of working. Like it's for mobile games, such as small device, so the codes should be profiled as much. So that those are actually like inbuilt tools within the engine or within the frameworks. Um, so my uh, actually I don't have much slides. I'm actually trying for like a live demo of the game. So uh, so uh, the next one is actually the tools. One of the tools tools actually we have the cross platform tools and the uh, native ones. The cross platform means uh, you write code in one language and you could actually uh, deploy that game to multiple platforms. Like the Unity, it's actually the uh, popular one at this moment, that's actually designed for uh, making games on mobile platforms. Uh, so you, that's actually using uh, three different languages, one is C-sharp, uh, another one is uh, Unity script, which is actually almost the same as JavaScript, and the third one is Go. Uh, mostly everybody uses C-sharp as it's an tutorial language. Uh, so you write the code in the C-sharp, and you could actually deploy that game uh, in multiple platforms like uh, iOS, Android, Blackberry, not just the mobile handheld devices, but also the consoles, and also a uh, Mac machine or like a Windows machine, or browser, anything. But still, some of these are actually just the pro version only allowed, but still, you have the option to do that. The next one is a Flash, which is the next popular thing for making 2D games. Uh, still, it's really popular. That, uh, there are lots and lots of games are made in the Flash. Uh, which may not look like those are made, but still, you won't believe it, but those are actually really done and completely made in Flash. The third one is Coco Studio X, LibGenius. Coco Studio is a C++ framework. So the Unity and the Flash have a, a, a visual interface for you actually to do it. But the Coco Studio is LibGenius and the Mobile SDKs, those are actually just frameworks which you have to integrate with uh, any IDs like Visual Studio, uh, or Eclipse or anything, and you have to do it in uh, those things. But those are all uh, 2D frameworks. Uh, Coco Studios is actually using C++, uh, LibGenix is using Java, and Normal is also using C++. And most of the native ones, uh, the iOS has a uh, Sprite kit, uh, built in 2D framework. Uh, the, from iOS 8 onwards, it's actually supporting the 3D ones too. So, you have the opportunity to build games using that model. That's actually uh, all about the, uh, the slides. Now I'm actually jumping on to my live demo. <coughs> so, uh, so in, uh, in app, uh, we are actually uh, using the Unity engine building games. So what I'm actually planning is actually a small uh, game where it's like you have a single single ball and uh, you have all these squares. So all thing you have to do is you just have to collect all these uh, ones and uh, once you have collected all the five uh, cubes, you win the game. That's one scenario that I'm going to go do. So the things that I'm gonna discuss here is actually how you communicate with the keyboard uh, inputs, like how the physics works, how the collision works, uh, uh, and how the uh, game win scenario and the game over scenario. That if I actually hit on the ball, the game's done. So how that works? That's those are the ones uh, steps that I'm gonna discuss today. Mm. So first thing is actually making the uh, the scene. That means the uh, you have the walls and everything else. So, uh, if you look up here, uh, this is the, the game board, the complete game board. It's a, it's a really big board. So, what I have up here is actually a simple floor uh, which have a texture up here. So, how I actually make this uh, floor 
is that uh, I can actually go up to this game object. So before that, let me just give you a brief idea of this uh, complete interface. So up here, I have these scenes. Scene is where we actually, whatever objects or whatever stuff we make, we can actually see in this world. We can actually go around, click on these objects, move these objects back. So those are the ones. This complete scene where we actually build the level. So uh, on down here, which is a game scene, where we actually see, uh, you know, that that's how we actually see the camera, like how stuffs are rendered. Everything you could actually find out in this game scene. On up here right is actually a hierarchical uh, panel where you, uh, whatever objects you have up here, whatever objects you made, all everything is actually uh, right underneath this hierarchical panel. On the down you have the projects panel where you actually could arrange stuff like the forms, the materials, the uh, the scenes, the scripts, the structures, and everything out. Whatever you have, you can actually put in uh, inside these single folders. You can make the folders by right clicking, and you can actually create folders. And it, this is actually uh, just arranging stuff so that another person or like a third person can actually just see and find out. Okay, all these textures for the floor actually goes inside this folder. Pick up players, everything out. So it's not messy. So you can actually arrange out everything. On the inspector side, like if you actually click on a single uh, object, like let's say the main camera, camera is the one which renders the scene. You can have multiple cameras, but uh, but at a time you need to have a single, at least a single camera to render the scene. So if you click on object, the inspector shows all the uh, properties of the camera. So the camera does have a transform, that's the position, the rotation, and the scaling of the object. And since the camera doesn't have a scale, but still. Those are the transformers. Then the camera has a number of properties inside it, just like the camera, or every single object has their own properties. Like if you take a mesh, if you take an object, then it has a mesh, it has a mesh a collider, then it has a material which has the textures is being applied to the uh, material. So if you take this uh, floor, just the floor, it's a mesh which has a, a complete mesh, which has a mesh collider applied to it, and also a uh, a material which uh, which has the textures applied to it. So if I have to make a plane, that's like you go to the uh, game objects and you uh, create a cube or like a plane. You create a plane. Uh, you, you create a plane, and if you want like a big plane, then you can actually scale it to like ten times or twenty times. You actually scale it out. That's how big you get. Then if you are by default, it has like a mesh collider and mesh render and everything. And default, it comes with a material which you won't be able to edit it. So you may have to create another material and apply the textures to it and just apply it to this um, same object. So you get a plane with all the textures that you want. So at this moment, right, I have a plane and I have a different. Uh, I have a plane and I have. Uh, balls, which has been done with uh, simple cubes, but in which I actually scale the cubes to uh, specified size to actually make the balls. That's why, I, and I put the uh, apply the materials to these objects to make this scene, this level. So next thing is actually uh, next is actually I have to make a, a player. <coughs> A player, up here the player is actually the, uh, the sphere. So I have the player. I made a small sphere and, and I have the sphere collider everything out. And also I made this uh, object a rigid body. And so if I want to actually hit uh, something, if hit any other objects, uh, if the collision should work, uh, the object should have a rigid body. And if I want to actually uh, roll the board, I have to actually rigid body. This board, if the physics has to work on that body, and it should be a rigid body. So I have a rigid body applied up here. So how we apply all these stuffs is that on every single object, there is an add component up here. So if you go to the add component, you have a, you have a couple of lots of uh, options up here. So if you go to the mesh, you have a, you can apply mesh filter or like a text mesh <coughs> or a mesh render to it. If you go to the physics, you can apply rigid body, you can apply character controllers or like colliders, Anything, like whatever you want for, to be applied for that body, you can apply it up here. So uh, one thing is that if I want to actually move this object, 
if I want to actually move this object when I click the, uh, the keyboard controllers, then I should have like a script attached to that body saying that okay, I have to move. When I press the W, the ball should roll forward. Okay, when I press the A or D, it should move towards that side. So if I have to do, I have to apply a script that's saying that okay, this is how we communicate. So up here I have a play controller script, uh, which is actually doing the job. So I'll just go to the script and say, uh, so I have like a play. This is a, this is a string shot code. So uh, it's been uh, derived from uh, mono behavior. So the Unity is actually using the mono, the uh, multi-platform dot and frame of mono, uh, which is doing the job. So up here I have uh, a play controller script, which is been derived from uh, mono behavior. So what I need is actually uh, uh, get the inputs from the keyboard and apply a movement, apply a force to the body so that the body actually rolls. <laughs> so what I have done is that uh, the structure actually, the so mono behavior as an interface, has an interface like it goes with like a start function. So what the start function or like a what awake function, so awake function what it does is that uh, if the object is actually awake, like if the object is enabled or disabled, whatever things that you have scripted or done inside the awake function does. Like whenever the object is being created, if you have like uh, okay, let's uh, let's take. I have to update the counter when I'm awake. If you have, if you have written like uh, update I plus plus in just an awake button, then when, whenever the object is been enabled, it increments the counter. So we have a start button where we initialize stuffs. Then we have an update function which is actually uh, cycling. The update function runs every single frame. So what if you have to? If you need to actually um, look for something like you know. Whenever you actually press the uh, forward button, so the script has to always check to see when I, if I'm pressing the forward button, if I'm pressing the forward button. So the all the uh, you know listening steps we actually do, we actually write in the update functions. That's when he listens. He listens every single frame to see if I'm pressing that button. So I'm actually up here. I'm writing it on a fixed update. So fixed update is another other function which actually uh, runs in its every fixed frame. So the problem with being the just the update function and the fixed function is that uh, the update function the cycle changes uh, according to the frame rate. Like uh, if I have a really like if I have an iPhone four and I have an iPhone six, iPhone comparing to the hardware devices they are much different. So the game in the iPhone four might work uh, slow, and the iPhone six it might work pretty fast or like an update sixty frames per second. So the the frame rate is actually different uh, at that moment. So the update function, if I'm writing a, a listening code in the update function, if, since the frames are different, the calls might, we might miss the calls. So the uh, um, advantage in going with the fixed function is that it doesn't matter which device it is, it still works at a fixed frame. So we could actually, we won't miss any frames or we won't miss any uh, physics actions at that moment. So what I'm going to appear is that, um, I'm doing an input class, which is a built-in class. So I'm getting the axis. Axis is actually the vertical. The vertical axis means uh, the up and down arrows, and the horizontal is actually the left and right. So I'm uh, so this input get axis actually returns a value between negative one and positive one. So if uh, it's the vertical means positive one, you are actually completely you're going towards the front. Minus one is actually you're going backwards. So I'm taking that float values uh, into a variable called move vertical and move horizontal and I'm taking, making a vector 3. So vector 3 is a 3D axis. So it's, you have an x axis, y and z. So when you're actually moving forward, you're actually moving towards the z axis. Left and right is actually the x. So I'm taking the values as plus c and minus c and plus x and minus x. So I'm making a vector 3 uh, where I'm giving the, the horizontal values that means the x plus x and minus x for the x, the y is actually zero because I'm not jumping up here. So y is towards the height. So if I'm jumping, I have to give uh, a value towards the y. So at this moment, since I'm not jumping, I'm not planning to move in the y direction, I'm giving a zero. The z is actually the move vertical. So I'm taking the uh, a vector three according to the inputs from my keyboard, and I'm applying a force. Applying a force uh, to this body. That's actually the moment into a speed. Speed is actually 
if I, if I don't have this feel, spin is actually the, uh, the force, an extra force that I'm putting on the body so that it will roll faster. So I'm multiplying that with the time or delta time so that uh, the delta time is actually the time difference between the frames so it will be fixed for every single device. So through just for this four lines, I'm actually able to uh, apply a force to the body um, and make it roll. I should actually see up here. Um, I can actually roll the board using those four lines. Then what I'm actually, what I'll actually do, yeah, that's is one thing, then I'm going to do the next scene to see if I can pick stuff. So I have a, a couple of objects up here. Uh, I've made a couple of cubes to see um, if I can pick those stuff. Then what I did is actually, um, let's see. So if I have to actually uh, hit uh, this small cube and pick it up, so I have to tell the uh, the player that okay, these are the objects that I need to be picked. Like if it shouldn't uh, when, when it hits the wall, it shouldn't say that oh, this is one of the objects that I need to be picked. It needs to know which are the objects that need to be picked. So what I, what's the option is that I can actually tag some of the objects to see okay, these are the objects that need to be picked. So the, whenever the object hits another object, it will check for the tag to see, okay, is this an object, is this object with the same tag that I'm asked to be big? So it will check every single time, whenever it hits an object, if it's hitting the ground floor, it will check for a tag to see if that is a, that's a tag, that is a tag he's looking for. So in this case, I have these small five cubes, just, I just made a single cube, and I have up here, you can see on the tag, I have a pickup tag applied to all these cubes. And I have the script inside this um, sphere, the ball, to see when it hits on the uh, cube, it checks to see that if that cube is actually goes for the speaker tag. If that's the case, it does the, the script whatever it's been asked for. Um, so if you check on this uh, play object, uh, <coughs> you can see on the score, here, uh, it checks for the trigger. So two things for the uh, two things for the uh, colliders that we have is we can make the colliders as trigger and uh, as just the colliders. So if you check, uh, I just untick the trigger, and if you uh, check, let me see. Okay. So this one, I just untick the trigger. So things that it's not actually collecting. So it's actually colliding with this object. That's not what we want. What we want is actually we have to pick up that object. So for that instance, I'm actually making that collider or that object as a trigger. So what it does is that it will trigger something when it's actually being hit. So uh, so when it actually goes inside, it will check to come there. So this object, so it's actually on trigger, enter, a collider, other. So other is actually the object or the pickup object that I hit. So it will check to see if it has a tag, like a pickup tag. It will compare to see. If it is, if it has this pickup cap, then what it does is actually set active force. That means it will deactivate that object. Then what it does is actually increment a counter. Because I, I'm actually picking up, so I'm actually, I have to increment a counter. And I, uh, and I, um, pass that counter as a parameter to an update score function. So what this update score does is that it actually displays that score uh, onto a uh, texture. That's actually UI UI stuff, which I will report. Then, uh, then I have to check to see, let's see, every time I pick up, I have to check, each time I have to check to see if that is the number of objects that needs to be picked. But I'm actually at this moment I've only told for I've only five objects to be picked. So once I have picked up the five objects, it's a, a game win scenario. So at this moment, at this code, uh, I check each time to see if that count is actually greater than or equal to the number of objects that need to be picked. If that is so, then uh, I uh, turn on, like uh, uh, enable a status message, and I put in the message as you win. So this is what actually happens when you actually pick up, pick up uh, objects. 
And the next thing is actually uh, when you hit the walls, it's a game over scenario. So those are actually not triggers. Those are actually just collision. You're actually colliding with a wall to see if I if I hit a wall, and that's like a game over scenario. So at this moment, I'm also doing the same thing. I'm comparing the tag to see if that's a wall. And also the next thing is that, uh, let's take a scenario like I have, uh, I, I, win, I win the game. So at this at here, if I win the game, I'm not actually stopping the board. It's still rolled. In that case, uh, in that case, if I, I'll actually show that. So what's actually happening is that it's a uh, you have collected all the objects. Okay, you have collected all the objects, but still, when you hit the wall, it should actually check to see uh, is it do we have still do we still have another couple of objects to be picked up? That's the only case when you actually need to show the game over scene, or else it's a game win scene. So at this code, I'm actually checking to see if the count is actually less than the number of objects to be picked. If, if not, then I don't have, if that's the only case when I have to actually uh, show the game over scene. If that's not the case, then it's actually a game win. Because at this moment, if I game, if I win the game, but still the board is rolling. So at this moment, if I hit the board, then it shouldn't show the game over scene because I'm already in the win state. So you'd have to check that scenario too. In the case, if I have uh, any more objects to be picked up. Um, <coughs> then, uh, showing the uh, score. So, showing the score is actually, Unity has actually uh, uh, brought in a new uh, Unity 4.6 onwards. It has a new UI system. So, that actually uh, completely takes all the works of showing uh, the UI on multiple, uh, like, those platforms. The thing with the main problem when showing the the UI actually the uh, score anything to the um, cross platform is that uh, every single device has a completely different resolution. Like if you go for the Android, it's actually a twelve eighty by eight hundred for almost all the device. So you don't actually have to worry about uh, placing a UI, uh, placing a text on a on a place. Like no, it it won't change much if you have. If you are actually planning for just the Android device, all the device or the resolution is the same. So once you have placed this this score, this uh, the zero score up in the center, it will be on the center for all the Android devices. But since we are uh, planning for a cross platform, you have to think about the iOS version too. Since the iOS versions, all the devices have a completely different resolution. So. Uh, the main problem goes for the iOS 5, which is actually a 1136 by 640, which is a completely different than the Android ones. So this positioning of this UI, the objects, completely different for every single device. So before this uh, version of this new Unity uh, UI system introduced, we have to actually completely do that through code. So I have to check for this uh, the screen width and height of every single device, and I have to. Uh, you know, subtract or add stuff according to the resolution wise and everything else. So those things actually work really good, but there's a really hectic work to be done to actually find that and we have to check every single device to see uh, if that goes the same way for everything. But with the new UI system, uh, they take all the hard, hard parts. So um, mostly everything actually uh, <laughs> scale, they actually do all the scripting works, everything down for them. So we don't have to actually work about uh, uh, worry about anything regarding the resolution wise. So what this new UI is all about is uh, 
You know, it's actually a canvas, a completely big canvas that you could actually see up here. It's a completely big canvas which has a which has a canvas which has the same thing like the transforms. Then the scaler ones up here. So what they did, they actually brought in the stuff with so scale, with the screen size, a constant physical size. They gave some couple of options for uh, so that we could actually completely focus on implementing the gameplay rather than uh, working hard on implementing the UI stuffs. So also there's a score stuffs. Score actually has a canvas renderer which has like a text components attached to it. So uh, Everything is actually done by them. So all the UI stuffs, uh, there's a lots of uh, work, uh, less works to be done. And then, but the thing is that uh, still it's just showing the score. It's just giving us the option, giving us the option of doing visual stuffs. But still, we need to have a communication between the UI as well as with the uh, the script. Mostly, we have to tell once I picked up the object, I have to tell the UI to see, okay, so update the score update the score and display the score on the screen. That's what I actually did uh, up here on the update score. Like I have a score.text is equal to value of two string. So that score.text is actually uh, a public uh, text score that I was given up here. On this you can actually see I have the, the score. So this this text is actually the same one. So I actually told, I've actually connected the player with the score to see update the score, update this one, this text box with the score that I currently have. I'm, I'm, uh, so this is a message, this is a message uh, on which I'm actually passing in the win scenarios as well as the uh, game over scenario. So currently I have this message uh, disabled, I have this message disabled. So I'm actually enabling this message uh, based on the uh, the win scenario and the lose scenario, so I checked up for the counts up here, and I enabled that uh, game object, and I put in that text as you win, and I put that uh, game over scenario, then I put in the message as game over. Plus, I do have a a button up here. We can actually see. I have a button up here. Uh, so that's uh, this reset button. So once I press the reset button, the game should uh, restart itself. So for that, uh, I have to put in another script to see if once if I actually have pressed the button, then on click function. There's on click function. Then I have to actually restart the game. So for that, I have uh, so game manager. So game manager actually has a method, a function up here to see that load the level. So is everything actually a levels? So I'm actually loading that level again to see uh, and put everything upon the uh, the default status. Now, next thing is that if uh, once the if you check up here, when the ball is actually rolling, the camera is following the ball. The camera is actually following the ball. So I have to do uh, another script to say that when the ball is rolling, I have to ask the camera to actually follow the ball uh, at every single frame. So what actually uh, did up here is that. Here is that the camera controller. There's a kind of camera controller. So I'm actually telling which object it should follow. So it's the player object which is need to be followed. And I'm actually putting an offset because every single frame, if you actually check, the camera is always at a, at a some distance away from the player. So I have to fix. I have to tell the camera to say that okay, move uh, like at this much distance from the player. And always follow the player at that much distance. So. Uh, I actually on the start, as I told, as on the start function itself, when the when the game object actually starts, I'm actually taking, I'm actually caching the current uh, position of the player, the current position of the camera actually, the current position of the camera, and I'm actually uh, offsetting that distance, current position with the player's position. 
So I'm actually taking the player's current position and I'm offsetting that to the depot, the current uh, camera position. Because I have the camera already placed at, uh, at a distance away from the player. So I'm actually, I always want this camera to be at this distance. So what I did is that I'm, I'm taking cache in this position when the script starts. I'm taking this position, cache in this position, and I'm telling the camera, oh, okay, take the position of the player, the player, and then keep a distance, this much distance from the player at every single frame. <coughs> so I'm doing that as a late update because uh, I have to follow the player, not just move along with the player, I have to follow the player. So I'm doing a late update so that it will take the position of the player, player and then keep an offset. So those are actually the main steps that we uh, do. But this is just a simple game, the simple logic game. The, but the logic actually grows as, as complicated the game it is. So here all the scripts and all the stuff that I have, which actually have a script to actually tell the player to uh, you know, communicate with the keyboard stuff, roll the floor, and once you hit the pickup object, you have tell the, uh, the ball to what to do, if that's a wall or if that's a pickup object, if that's a pickup object, pick it up, update the score, if that's a wall, then check to see if you have any more objects to be uh, picked up. That's the case, then it's a game over. Or you are already in the win state. Uh, those are actually some basic gameplays and game, game mechanisms for this small single game. But once the game grows, like a uh, shooting game or like for the arrow bike or any other games that we have built for the end, the, uh, the logic actually grows. Like it's actually you are riding a bike, you turn, you hit, you, you uh, fell off the road, then what should happen? It's logic actually grows a lot. At this moment, we need to have like a complete manager, a complete game manager to see. Uh, you should have some game manager to hold all the scores at every <coughs> single moment. You should have like a state, like it's a starting state. To start at the starting state, uh, the bike should be right. Then if it's in the playing state, then playing stops. Then if it's a posing state, then the music should stop. Then you should actually show uh, whatever the uh, post uh, scenes it is. Like it's actually as the brain grows along with it. So these are actually the uh, some of the main stuff. Um, that's all for the demo. Then uh, going back, this is actually the. Uh, The games that we have built in an app, that's the uh, cross cache, uh, the aerobike, and the Fury. The three games at this moment, and we are actually planning for a gradation of the aerobike with a uh, completely new interface and new stuff. And those are the ones, and thank you.